In this episode, we will take a detailed look at the computer animations that were shown to the jury in the patent case of Fonar v. General Electric. Fonar, a small company in New York, headed by Dr. Ray Demadian, introduced the world's first commercial whole-body MRI machine in 1980. In 1985, Fonar received a patent on an improved MRI system that could make the scanning process more efficient by allowing the machine to take multiple images at different angles to each other during a single scanning session. In 1995, Fonar sued General Electric for infringement of this patent. In order for the jury to make an informed decision on the technical infringement issues, it was necessary to give them a detailed, yet straightforward understanding of how an MRI machine generates images, and specifically for this case, how it generates multiple images at different angles in a single scanning session. The tutorial started with a 3D model of a patient. A side or sagittal view MRI image of the lumbar spine was shown in place on the patient, then extracted from the lower back region. The goal of the animated tutorials was to demonstrate how images of this sort are made. Unlike a photographic image, where contrast is due to differences in intensity of visible light, in an MRI image the contrast is due to something called T1 and T2 relaxation times and proton density. I will describe the series of exhibits used to teach the jury what these things are and how they work to form an MRI image. On the MRI image, we started by highlighting and zooming into a tiny region on one of the spinal discs. This close-up shows an array of hydrogen atoms, represented by blue balls with arrows. The hydrogen atoms are part of the natural elements found in the tissues of the body. The blue ball is the symbol for the hydrogen nucleus, which is a single proton. The arrows represent the direction of the tiny magnetic fields associated with each hydrogen nucleus or proton. Under normal conditions, these tiny magnetic fields are oriented in random directions, but they snap into alignment with a strong external magnetic field. Such a strong external magnetic field is one of the key components of an MRI scanner. Exposing these aligned and spinning protons to a pulse of radio frequency, or RF energy, causes them to spin 90 degrees away from the original axis in a process called spin flipping. The T1 time is simply the time that it takes for the proton to return to alignment with the external magnetic field. It turns out that the T1 time is dependent on the type and condition of the tissue that contains the protons. To understand T2, let's look at several protons all spinning in alignment with the magnetic field. A pulse of RF energy sets them spinning 90 degrees away from the original axis. As they spin, some of the protons start to slow down and drift out of phase with the others. This is called dephasing. T2 is the time for the protons to reach this dephased condition. Like T1, the T2 time is dependent upon the type and condition of the tissue that contains the protons. If these dephased protons are hit with another pulse of RF energy that is twice as strong as the spin-flip pulse, all the protons flip 180 degrees at the same time. When this happens, their differences in spin start to bring them back into phase in a process called spin-echo. Now that we have the basics, let's look at our patient inside the MRI machine. The large gray blocks above and below the patient are the permanent magnets that supply the strong external magnetic field. The bottom magnet is the south pole and the upper magnet is the north pole, creating a magnetic field in the direction of the blue arrow. As the patient slides into the machine, his protons snap into alignment with this magnetic field. Here we see a section of his lumbar spine along with three green geometric axis indicators. Looking at this close-up of the spinal section, we see a representation of the MRI operator adjusting the machine to take a side view image through the center of the spine. This process results in a scout scan. Later we will see how this image is used by the operator to select the positions and rotations of the multiple angle images described in the patent. Next, we pull out a single plane of protons that lies along the selected image plane. Notice that they all spin in alignment with the magnetic field, either pointing up or down. 
The first spin flip radio pulse sets all the protons spinning at 90 degrees to their original alignment. A magnetic gradient, which is just a magnetic field that varies in strength from weak to strong, is applied in the direction of the arrow to force the protons to spin at different phases, depending upon the strength of this new magnetic gradient. The different phases will be used to determine the proton's position along the z-axis of the patient. Next, another magnetic gradient, at right angles to the first, forces the protons to spin at different frequencies, depending upon the strength of this field. These different frequencies will be used to determine the proton's position along the y-axis of the patient. The other part of the story is that these spinning protons emit radio waves. These radio waves carry information about the position of the proton as well as the condition of the tissue in the T1 and T2 times. These radio waves are picked up by an antenna that is wrapped around the patient. A radio receiver amplifies these waves and sends them to a computer where they are converted into digital data and analyzed. The computer stores the raw data in a two-dimensional array, shown here as a series of various shade gray blocks. Each block is a pixel which will form part of the final image. At this stage, the intensity of the pixel, ranging from black to white, is directly related to the T1 and T2 times that are determined by the characteristics of the tissue containing the protons. However, these pixels are not yet in the correct locations on the image. In order to place them, the computer needs to do two more steps. First, the computer processes each row of pixels using a mathematical algorithm called a Fast Fourier Transform, or FFT, to arrange the blocks in the correct horizontal position. This makes use of the phase information that was applied to the protons with the first magnetic gradient. Then the computer processes each column of pixels using another FFT pass to arrange them in the correct vertical position. This makes use of the frequency information that was applied to the protons with the second magnetic gradient. The MRI image is now complete. This low resolution example was useful to show the process steps but doesn't look like a useful image. If this entire process is done at a higher resolution, meaning more pixels, a useful image is obtained. With this background information we can now turn to the subject of the patent obtaining multiple images at different angles during a single scan. In order to apply the different magnetic gradient fields, the MRI machine contains three sets of electromagnets called the X, Y, and Z coils positioned around the scanning volume. This exhibit shows the location of those coils on the left side of the screen and the coil controls in the box on the right. The green, blue, and red bars labeled X, Y, and Z are slider type controls that represent the electrical power applied to each coil. For example, when the Z slider is pushed up from its neutral or off position, the Z coils are energized and produce a magnetic field, indicated by the purple arrows, inside the scanning volume. The other coils work in the same fashion, producing their magnetic fields in the other two directions. Energizing two coils at a time causes the magnetic field to form at an angle. Varying the power to the two coils rotates the magnetic field to any desired angle. The final factor in determining where an image will be formed is in selecting the frequency of the applied radio pulses. In our model, the frequency of these pulses is indicated by the slider labeled F. Low frequency is yellow, medium is cyan, and high is magenta. In this example, the Z coil is energized and a low or yellow radio frequency pulse is applied. In this condition, the image plane being scanned is indicated by the yellow square inside the scanning volume. Changing to the medium or cyan frequency moves the image plane to the center of the scanning volume. And changing to the high or magenta frequency moves the image plane to the right end of the scanning volume. We can now demonstrate how different types of scans are made by manipulating these four controls. We will start with the single image orthogonal mode or sort. The energizing of the coils and the application of the radio frequency pulses are shown as before in the scanning volume and the control box at the top of the screen. In the black box at the bottom of the screen are two lines of pulses. The top line shows, in graphic form, the timing and magnitude of the color-coded gradient control signals, while the bottom line displays the various transmitted and received radio signals. 
In the single image orthogonal mode, the gradient coils are energized individually and only one frequency of radio pulse is applied. The image is taken from the left end of the scanning volume. In the multiple image orthogonal mode, or MORT, the gradient coils are again turned on individually, but different frequencies of RF are used to move the image plane through the scanning volume along a single axis. In the multiple image oblique mode, the gradient coils are fired in pairs to rotate the gradient fields. As different frequencies of RF are applied, the image plane moves at an angle through the scanning volume. And finally, we arrive at the subject of this patent, multiple angle oblique, or MAU scans. In this mode, the gradient coils are fired in differing combinations in order to rotate the image planes to different angles during the scan. This scheme, along with the different RF frequencies, causes the image plane not only to move within the scanning volume, but to rotate as well. This is the feature that allows many images at different angles to be made during a single scan. Here we see the operator setting the position and rotation of the numerous images to be captured. Now that the jury understood the required pulse sequences needed to create a multiple angle oblique scan according to Fonar's invention, they were shown that the same pulse sequence was being used in the GE machine, proving infringement. Thanks for sticking with me through this lengthy demonstration. Even though it was a long way from proton spin to multiple angle oblique MRI images, these exhibits proved to be a successful teaching tool. Exit interviews with the jurors revealed that they appreciated the fact that Fonar's attorneys were confident enough in their intelligence to teach them the technology and not just expect them to believe expert testimony on something that might be over their heads.